Julia Rutherford donation. Okay, so uh, it's been, you know, there we've we've made a shift away uh, in the past several years from from strict rest following concussion, right, to implementing obviously sub symptom, uh, you know, activity, particularly in the subacute phase. But we're going to do kind of a, a relatively quick, uh, you know, review. Uh, of active rehabilitation, right? Just some general guidelines. And we're going to be doing, obviously, a lot of these approaches in class together. Um, there we go. Sweet. All right. So here's the deal, right? When we talk about, when we talk about, obviously, management of concussion, right? We, we have to know that when we that ultimately when we're on the first 48 hours post concussion we have different priorities right um so who can tell me i mean i and i know that i'm probably repeating myself maybe beating a little bit of a dead horse here but within the first 48 hours following following concussion what are what are our priorities i mean obviously we know the patient has to rest but what do we do what's our job in the first 48 hours What do we I mean? What do, what do we need to rule out? What what are we looking for? You know, like make sure it's just a concussion, not like they're bleeding. They don't okay, have very bleed. Good. They don't have yep. Uh, yep. nerve injury, things like that. Okay. And how do we honor? So Bennett, yeah, great, great job. And I know that I've, like I said, I know I know we've done this over and over again, and I repeat myself a ton. But um, what types of things on our exam um, are we going to see? Uh, to essentially let us know that we don't need to refer. How are we going to know that based on our exam? Uh, the pupils are what the DC direct and consensual. Okay, that's one key one. Yep. So we're going to have basically Drew, as you as you stated, yep, we're going to have a normal cranial nerve exam, right? Normal cranial nerve exam, uh, no focal neurologic deficits, not a ton of weakness, anything like that. Right, I think that makes sense to everybody. Normal cranial nerve exam, uh, without any, uh, you know, potential concern for focal neurologic deficit. Um, so, I think are we are we all good there as far as that goes? I think we all get that. Okay, cool. So obviously, here's the deal. Um, we know that obviously we have to have a normal neurologic exam. If we see, for example, you know, uh, any uh, abnormal cranial nerve. Uh, you know, exam and or uh, the presence of deteriorating symptoms within those first 48 hours. So, and I, when, when I say deteriorating symptoms, who can tell me what I mean by deteriorating symptoms? Like, they, as in oh, oh. symptoms getting worse? Okay. So, so yeah, Charlie, you're definitely right when, when we say symptoms getting worse, but we're talking about drastic change in those symptoms from, you know, yeah, I have a headache and I'm dizzy and I have these concussion symptoms to I have, you know, I'm, I'm vomiting like constantly. My headache hurts. My head hurts really, really bad. Right. And I'm starting to actually kind of, um, kind of have like personality mood changes. Right. Instead of getting a little bit worse, I'm getting a lot, like a lot worse quickly. Does that make sense, Charlie? Do you see, kind of see the difference there? Yeah, one's a lot more aggressive than the other. So you're seeing them get a lot worse and it's happening super fast. That's when you need to refer. That's deteriorating symptoms. Okay, and I know that's kind of maybe kind of a nebulous concept, but I think that makes sense to us. Okay, here's the deal. Um, obviously, we know that according to the guidelines, within the first 20, 48, 24 to 48 hours, we are going to be essentially promoting rest, as much rest as possible, right? So we want the patient to obviously go you know, back to their room, go home in a quiet environment and just relax, right? They can sleep, you know, obviously we don't recommend medication, but if they need to take medication, they can take Tylenol, okay? And I think we all know why we would recommend Tylenol as opposed to an NSAID. That makes sense to all of us, okay? Now, really important, and I'll, I'll show you guys an example of this. Super important to provide the patient with home care instructions, okay? Home care instructions. So generally, right? Uh, 
providing the patient with written instructions in regards to what to do or how to manage this concussion not only helps the patient because patients after concussion will forget things. They will not remember what you told them, right? And so it's extremely important to have things written down for them that, so that they can actually take them home, particularly for mom, dad, boyfriend, girlfriend, whoever it is, right, that's helping them. Okay, and so obviously, in this immediate post-concussive phase as well, um, we're going to essentially set that appointment to see the patient again, right? Um, you know, to do a serial evaluation and also potentially neurocognitive testing, all right? All right, and also obviously starting the process for referral uh, to, to, to a physician. So um, there there are, and guys, there, there are concussions that you guys are gonna see in your careers where you are very confident as a clinician that you can manage this on your own. Um, and, it's, and, and, and you should feel confident uh, with a good majority of concussions to be able to manage those on, their, on your own. But the bottom line, okay, is that the medical legal environment that we live in, as well as uh, current guidelines, recommend, you know, recommend uh, that they also be seen by a physician, okay? So don't, you know, just always have a low threshold and be smart in regards to referring uh, those patients. All right, here's the deal. You guys are going to get asked a lot, right? Uh, particularly if you have a, a parent or a family or a boyfriend, girlfriend, whoever it is, and it's their first time, okay, dealing with someone that has a concussion. You're going to be asked some questions. They're going to ask you, right, well, you know, he has a concussion. Why shouldn't we just take him directly to the hospital? Okay, and the diplomatic answer there is, you know, if you want to, you can, but a lot of, but, you know, generally speaking, immediate referral to the, to the, to the, you know, to the ED or ER um, with a concussion like this, without any, any signs of, uh, you know, severe neurological deterioration is generally not recommended, you know, and the other thing that, that they'll ask, well, shouldn't we go ahead and get a CT, um, you know, and, or, you know, or imaging, what about imaging? Right. So here's a, here's a question for you guys, and I, I'm I bring, I'm bringing this up here because I don't know that we've actually had this conversation in class. Right? Does CT or MRI diagnose concussion? No. Okay. And is that something that you guys just knew, or does it just make sense to you that yeah? I mean, it would make sense that CT and MRI don't diagnose concussion. So, I mean, obviously, if we have, right, a positive finding on CT or MRI, is it a concussion? It's not, right? So we're looking at other types of non-concussive neurotrauma, like a bleed or what have you, right? Does that, does that make sense, guys? Concussion is, a t is it, you know, is an injury that results in temporary changes that resolve, and this is often not picked up on diagnostic imaging and cannot be picked up on diagnostic imaging. Okay. The other thing that you guys are going to see that, that are, that's going to be asked of you, right, after concussion is parent, parents are going to ask you, well, I thought that I was supposed to, you know, wake them up every every hour to, and not let them sleep. No, let them sleep, right? That's not something that, that's, that's not something that you need to do, right? So if you think back to our first lecture on concussion, right, and, and the metabolic changes that happen after concussion, what are what are what are a couple of things that that happen post concussion that you think you know we need to essentially utilize rest at least acutely to kind of try and remedy like you said metabolically the there isn't enough blood glucose getting to the brain yep so like that's why There's we're resting there. Right. There's increased metabolic demand due to the misfiring of the sodium potassium pump, and we ha and we have low glucose in the brain, so it kind of sets us up for a metabolic disaster, right? And the only way that we can attempt to actually kind of try and correct that imbalance uh, is by obviously physical and cognitive rest within the first 48 hours. Okay, um, so obviously extending rest or at least strict rest past that time frame uh, is really is really is not as opt is, is not as optimal as we have thought in the past. Okay. So here we go. Once we get outside of the acute phase, guys. Okay, um, out of the outside of the outside of that initial forty-eight hours, we need to essentially see them again and conduct 
a, an additional symptom survey, right? So we need to take them back through. Uh, if we've already done the full SCAT-5, then we don't need to do the full thing again. We just need to do another symptom survey, right? Serial symptom surveys are important because it allows us to track people's symptoms from day to day, right? And I think you guys know that, and I think that makes sense to you, okay? One thing that you guys will see is it's really common after concussion for symptoms to go like this, right? For them to start here, get worse, and then slowly get better, right? So it's not uncommon for people to have worse symptoms, you know, within a few days to a week after concussion, and then have those actually resolve a little bit over time. Um, so one thing, obviously, too, after you're seeing this patient again acutely, as a part of your management plan, if you if you utilize this as a part of your management plan, which I hope you would, right, uh, conduct neurocognitive testing as well, if that's impact um, or any other type of uh, uh, neurocognitive test, okay? Um, and we'll, we will, we'll talk more about that as well, uh, what that looks like and how to kind of, you know, conduct and interpret that test, right? So... The other thing too is we need to ensure that appropriate return to learn strategies have been implemented, right? And so we talked a little bit about return to learn, notifying professors that a, that, that a concussion has occurred, right? Teachers, professors, right? And, and ensuring that uh, we can kind of get those academic accommodations in place for, for patients. So um, before we, um, well, before we kind of move into, these last few slides and talking about active rehabilitation, uh, at least the basics of how to apply it. What questions do you guys have up to this point on the initial management? I think, I mean, obviously, I think you guys are grasping this really, really well, right? I think this makes sense to all of you. Um, but what about this is fuzzy, if anything, still? I guess, I guess you guys, you guys are good. I think then you guys are in a good spot then. That's what I'm saying. Okay, good. All right. Here's the deal. Okay. So when we talk about active rehabilitation, all right, we know that, uh, or at least literature has actually uh, kind of pointed out that strict rest following 48 hours, right, can, can actually lead to prolonged recovery, right? So uh, super important, right? That symptom limited activity should be applied as soon as reasonable, right? In that subacute phase. So after they're outside of that 48 hour, uh, 48 hours phase, right? We can start applying that sub symptom threshold activity, particularly ADLs, right? So here's a question for you guys. What do you do? Let's say you're three or four days out and your patient still has a pretty big symptom burden. Are you going to, what, I mean, what do you think you would look for? before you start applying symptom limited activity? What if they're still really, really acute at day three or four? What do you think you would do? Redo your exam and check for like a bleed or anything that okay. you missed or? Yep, beautiful point. Yep, re-examine them first, right? Exa absolutely right, Bennett, yes. Do another exam, cover your bases, right? Then, okay. What about recommendations though for activity? Should we maybe have them, you know, should we just put them right into symptom limited activity if they're still that acute? Or do we need to, you know, kind of tell them, okay, look, you can do a little bit here and there, uh, but still kind of, I would still rest um, for another day or two until you start to really kind of feel better. What do you think, what, what do you think makes sense in that situation? I'd say you keep waiting. Okay, so I'd have them. I'd have them rest a little bit longer, right? And then once we start to see some of those symptoms kind of peel off a little bit or start to subside, then we can really kind of start talking about right that symptom limited activity, and and really, really that applies even if they're still symptomatic, right? They're just not going to be able to do as much if they have a really big symptom burden and they're four days out. I think that makes sense to everybody. Um, okay. So here's the thing. Um, most, you know, most uh, most researchers and, and a lot of the literature basically agrees that active rehabilitation sh should start uh, within one month of the injury. Okay, here's the biggest challenge. Here's the biggest challenge with active rehabilitation, guys, is this is this is actually still so new and still kind of so cutting edge, quote unquote, in regards to concussion. 
we still don't have, um, excuse me, an actual protocol for how to apply this. We were, and I know that sounds kind of goofy, right? But we don't. Um, we don't actually have an actual standardized protocol, right, for how to apply these interventions in clinical practice. We know, right, we know what we can do, but we don't necessarily have a standardized approach yet, right? Um, so the one thing that we can do, though, is we can base our treatment approach on our assessment, okay? So in class, we learned how to essentially pick up on tropias, phorias, okay, and a near point of convergence greater than five centimeters, right? And then things like a positive Dix Hall pike. So in that vestibular ocular cluster, okay? That's an example. What if we had somebody, guys, that was telling us, you know, just through our, our, serial, our serial evaluations that we're doing, they're saying, yeah, you know, my neck really hurts and I have a headache and there's pressure behind my eyes, you know, um, and they're complaining of quite a bit of neck pain, right? How do you think that that would possibly change our approach uh, as opposed to, you know, taking more of an ocular, of a, a vestibular slash ocular approach to treatment? Obviously, we're going to do what? Or start where? Maybe take more of a cervical approach, right? Work on work on obviously manual techniques for the C spine, like we like we learned yesterday, right? Um, so that is, uh, yeah, you know, we're gonna that we're gonna kind of, gonna kind of change our approach up a little bit. Okay. All right. Here's the deal. So the other thing that we have to also do is we have to, in order to, in order to to prescribe right and or recommend that sub symptom threshold, we have to be able to objectively determine the point at which they become symptomatic, right? And so we we spent two days on this, okay, the Buffalo concussion treadmill test, um, and so this 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 is a tool that we can use, as we've said, okay, to determine that aerobic threshold. Um, now. Obviously, you know, most of our patients have wearable devices. So, you know, utilizing that heart rate, you know, whether it's an Apple Watch, Fitbit, whatever it is, right, provides the patient with, with, with an objective measure to say, okay, yeah, you know, I know we, we can set, you know, this, you know, the heart rate at a certain level, don't exceed 100 beats a minute, don't exceed 80 beats a minute, right, on your heart rate. So be mindful that when you're doing your activity throughout the day, that you stay kind of within that threshold. Right, super important, right? And I, I, I will tell you guys down here at the bottom, okay? Uh, this, this, uh, this point that I have down here that's bolded, right? Super important to note that there's not necessarily any true recommendation on the Buffalo concussion treadmill test as far as how to space out the tests. Uh, but uh, generally a rule of thumb, particularly if someone is continuing to recover, we typically would not administer these tests, uh, you know, inside of one week from each other, right? So generally speaking, try to space them out by at least one week. Um, and we do that obviously to be able to manage symptoms, but as we'll talk about when we talk about neurocognitive testing, also to minimize practice effect. Um, what do you guys remember about practice effect on testing for concussion, particularly diagnostic testing? What is that first of all? Who remembers it's when you do it so often that you kind of have practice at it so your baselines end up being yep. better than normal yep absolutely absolutely very good okay and so obviously by lengthening the amount of time between those test conditions right we're doing what we can to kind of try and kind of uh, curtail that practice effect, right? And so that's 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 kind of what we're kind of what we're going for, kind of trying to kind of trying to curtail that effect. All right, last last one, guys, and then I'll I'll let you have a good weekend. Okay, go have a good weekend. Okay, so obviously, guys, as we know, okay, symptoms are the guide. That is what that that is the criteria that we use for guiding treatment. Okay, so obviously, uh, you know. Any more than three than a three point increase in symptoms should prompt stopping treatment. We know that from the from the Buffalo concussion treadmill test, right? Um, and it's obviously you know uh, if we can keep the symptom or I'm sorry, keep the patient um, 
below that threshold in applying treatment, then we know that we're applying the treatment correctly and that we're applying it responsibly, right? It's also important to realize that in some people, they may, on a certain day that, that you're assessing them, present with a symptom that they've never had before. They may develop a new symptom, right, uh, throughout the course of their of their recovery. And it's really important to note if that happens, whether or not this is normal for them or whether this is just uh, kind of a, a new symptom that might be presenting for another reason, right? So, um, but as we know, most people are going to complain about the same groups of symptoms, right, day in and day out with concussion, right? They're, they're typically going to have uh, very similar presentations. Um, so we know, okay, that once they become symptom free, you know, we're going to essentially need to repeat our exam uh, to make sure that they're within normal ranges on testing uh, and or trending back towards normal, okay? This is a really important point actually, okay? The, it can be really difficult, sorry. It can be really difficult to recommend to, or to, to make a return to play decision uh, because there are many times when a patient's neurocognitive testing and their and even and sometimes even balance, but we see this most with neurocognitive testing, where those symptoms will not actually trend back towards baseline, or they, they will not actually normalize. They may get close to baseline, okay, but they may not be at baseline. So the bottom line is that you know you need to talk with your supervising physician, right? And uh, you, the two of you together need to make the decision right? Do we clear this person for participation or not, right? Depending on, the first and foremost, the clinical exam, what does your clinical gestalt tell you, right? Does your gestalt, meaning like your, into, your clinical intuition and experience, right? Does it tell you that this patient is actually getting better and then it's likely safe to start return to play, right? Or um, does it essentially, you know, or do, do, you need to, do you need to wait a little bit longer? right? And sometimes even though we may not hit that baseline value, right, we may notice a trend back towards that baseline value, and that might also be acceptable, okay? Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, all right. Any confusion on this, guys? I mean, and, and, and to be fair, I think, I mean, I, I know that I'm probably repeating myself, but I'm doing it for a reason because this is stuff that you have to know. Right, and I really want to make sure that you guys get this and learn it, and learn it well. Um, but no questions on this. I think we're in a pretty good spot. Okay. All right. So, um, if anything pops up or you have questions, we can definitely talk about it on Monday as well. Um, but thanks. For, uh, good job, guys, and thanks for being patient with me. But uh, yeah, that's it. Okay. You guys have a great weekend. If you need anything, let me know. All right. Have a good weekend, Wade. Bye, guys. Thank you, Wade. Yep. Have a good weekend, Wade. Yep, you too. Bye.